In the previous lecture, we looked at characterizing random vectors, and a random vector could have elements that were chosen from different measurements or from multiple time samples. Now, when we talk about random processes, we're specifically looking at samples of in time of a signal. So we can think about a random process as a collection of samples of a signal, and in general, that's going to go from minus infinity to infinity. So our independent variable here, n, denotes time. And when we get a sample from a random process, we can think about that as occurring by having a collection of waveforms, each of which lasts forever, and reaching a hand into this bin that has these different random waveforms and pulling one out. And we can relate this to the multivariate representations we use for vectors by thinking about a vector that gets really long the length of this vector gets longer and longer. And you can see that the characterization that we used for multivariate signals or random vectors becomes problematic because we took a vector that was length n and had defined the covariance matrix for that vector, called that R, and that was an n by n matrix. And that represented all the relationships between different elements of the vector. And clearly that becomes problematic as n goes to infinity when we have a time series and we think about that time series getting really long. And the ra random processes descriptions allow us to get around this limitation. Now we can come up with a complete probability description, say a probability density function, for this infinite duration random process x of n. But it turns out that's not really very practical in a lot of situations. So we're going to limit our discussion to the first two moments of the random process. That is, we're going to look specifically at the mean, which is the expected value of x of n. And remember, expectation carries the idea of reaching into the bin of random signals multiple times and then averaging over an infinite number of reaches into the bin. So the mean is just what happens on average to the value of x of n. And we'll define the autocorrelation as the average between the product of x of n and a delayed version of x of n, that is x of n minus k. So there's a lag of k samples between x of n and x of n minus k. Similarly, the autocovariance is defined like the autocorrelation, except in this case we subtract off the mean. So we take x of n minus its mean and look at how that varies on average with a value k steps away, again a leg k, where we've also subtracted the mean there. If the mean of a process is zero, in other words mu of n and mu of n minus k is zero, then the autocovariance and the autocorrelation are identical. So this is a way of describing how the mean changes over the random process and also how correlated different samples of this signal are in time. There's a lot of parameters here, even just looking at the first and second order statistics, because the mean is a function of n and thus could be infinitely long. Similarly, the autocorrelation is a function of both n and k, as are the, is the autocovariance. So it's conventional to consider a simplification that occurs when we have a stationary process. And what we mean by a stationary process, it's one whose characteristics don't change over time. So, for example, the mean, which we had was a function of time n, is just one value mu. So the mean is the same at every point in time for the waveform. And the autocorrelation, instead of depending on n, it only depends on how far apart the two samples are. We have eta of k. And for the autocovariance, it's the same thing. The autocovariance does not vary for different values of n. It only depends on k, where k is the lag or the distance that we're looking between the two samples. We can visualize this by considering a waveform. And we're going to look at the autocorrelation in this example. So here I have some waveforms sketched in green. And I've identified three different locations in that waveform. And we're going to look at how the relationship on average is between two samples five units apart. If I look at the expected value of x of n times x of 4, that's a definition of eta of 9 comma 4. 
because in this case we would have n being equal to 9 and k being equal to 5, so we have 9 comma 4. Now I can do the same thing at a different point in the waveform. Look at x50 and x45, and on average, how do they relate to one another? And that would give me eta of 50 comma 45, because over here n is 50, and we're looking five steps back, so k would be 5. And for the third interval, we'll look at n being equal to 85, k again being equal to 5, and I'm looking at the relationship now between x of 85 and x of 80, and that would be eta of 85 comma 80. So if this was a non-stationary process, the correlation between samples that are five steps apart could be different throughout the waveform. But if the waveform is stationary, then we're going to say that these characteristics or the correlation between different samples that are five steps apart does not change no matter where we are in the waveform. And consequently, we would have that eta of 9 comma 4, eta of 50 comma 45, eta of 8 of 5 comma 80, and any other interval where there's five steps between them is just equal to eta of 5. So the correlation between two samples of the waveform doesn't depend on what part of the waveform you're in. It only depends on how far apart those two samples are, or the lag, k. Now we can look at some non-stationary signals to get an idea of this. In this case, I've taken and simulated a signal where the mean is ch changing with time. Here the mean is given by n over 20. So you can see that the signal initially starts somewhat symmetric about zero, and then as we go on, the average value of the signal keeps growing and growing. For a second example, I chose to have a zero mean, but in this case, I'm going to change the variance of the signal. So for the first 30 samples, we'll assume that we have a unit variance signal, and in this case, the mean is zero. And then for the rest of this waveform, I'm going to assume that the variance is growing with n. The specific formula that's represented here is to take n minus 30 divided by 20. So the variance is really small when n is close to 30, and then as we get farther to the right, the variance grows and the signal gets bigger and bigger. And you can clearly see that this is non-stationary because the characteristics of this signal are changing with time. And then for the third example I'm going to give, we're going to look at where the correlation or the autocovariance changes with time. And we've got the mean equal to zero in this case, so the autocorrelation is identical to the autocovariance. For the first 50 samples, I generated a waveform where the ratio between the first value of the autocovariance, k equals 1, and the variance, or r of 0, is 0.9. So in this case, values of the waveform that are one sample apart, that's what r of 1 is telling us, should be highly correlated in the positive direction. So when you see that, that most of the time, if a sample is positive, the sample adjacent to it is also positive. Or if a sample is negative, the sample adjacent to it is also negative. So the samples tend to be pretty correlated. In the second half of this interval, I switched to a process where the correlation is negative 0.9. So this means that samples that are separated by lag of 1, or k equals 1, are going to have opposite signs in general. And you see that, that this process switches back and forth. So this would not be stationary because here we have one set of correlation, and here we have an entirely different correlation. The correlation of this waveform, or the autocovariance, depends on what time n we're looking at. Now we can look at some stationary signals, and the first one that I've picked is what I'll call a random binary waveform. We'll assume that x of n is equal to 0 or 1 with probability 1 half. So this is kind of equivalent to flipping a coin and deciding that I get a 1 if I pull a heads when I flip and a 0 if I get a tail. So here's an example of a random binary waveform. We reached into our bin full of such waveforms and pulled one out and displayed it here. Now we can look at the properties of this waveform. It turns out that the mean is exactly 1 half and it is independent of n because I have two possibilities. I can either get a zero value or a one. When I average over many, many waveforms, half the time it's going to be zero, half the time it's going to be one, and consequently my mean is one half. 
the autocorrelation is going to be one half when k is equal to zero because that represents the expected value of x of n squared. And you can see that if I square x of n, I get either 1 or 0. And half the time I've got 1, and half the time I've got 0. On average, I get 1 half. Now looking at product of x of n and some delayed version of x of n, with k not being equal to 0, I can either get a 1 in here or a 0. I get 0 if either x of n or x of n minus k is 0, and I get 1 if they're both 1. Only one fourth of the time are they both 1. So if I average over those, I get 1 fourth when k is not equal to 0. The second example is white Gaussian noise. And in this case, we'll define a signal Wn, which is drawn from a Gaussian distribution, and that's what this symbol n means. It's normal or Gaussian. The mean being 0, indicated by the first number, and the variance being equal to sigma w squared, representing the second number. And we'll assume that successive values of Wn are independent. In other words, the value of w at time 10 doesn't depend on the value of w at time 9. Here's an example of such a waveform. You can see sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, and there doesn't appear really to be any particular pattern. Well, in this case, the mean is 0, and so I can look at the autocovariance, and it turns out that when k is 0, I just got the squared value of w on average, which is the definition of the variance, so that's going to be sigma w squared. And when k is not equal to 0, then I'm looking at the product of values, w of n and w of n minus k, and what that becomes on average. And since these samples are independent, on average, that product is going to be 0. The third example that we'll consider is what I'm going to call a random sinusoid. And we'll define a signal y of n as an amplitude a times cosine of omega naught n plus phi, where we'll let the amplitude a be a random variable. And we'll assume that for this example, it's Gaussian or normally distributed with zero mean and variance sigma squared a. And then phi, the phase shift, We'll assume that's a uniform random variable distributed between 0 and 2 pi. And here I've drawn three different random waveforms that have different values for their amplitude a and their starting phase phi. Phase is going to determine where they start relative to the peaks, and then the a is going to determine how big of an amplitude they reach at maximum. Now in this case, if you think about reaching into a, a bin and pulling out waveforms that have this kind of description where the amplitude changes from pole to pole and the phase also changes, you can see that on average you're going to get a mean of zero because sometimes I'll have positive value here, other times I'll have negative values, and on average over many, many, many draws that goes to zero. Now the correlation, or the covariance, which is the same because the mean is zero, it's going to be a squared times the cosine of omega naught n plus phi times the cosine of omega naught quantity n minus k plus phi. So I have a product of cosines here, and we can simplify this using the formula for the product of cosines, and that's going to involve a cosine term for the difference of the two angles. And when I difference these two angles, the phi drops out and the omega naught n drops out, and I just get cosine omega naught k. So I'm taking the expected value of a squared times cosine omega naught k, and that's going to be the variance of a, and then the one half is from the trig identity associated with the product of the cosines. Now there's also another term when we do this trig identity that has the sum of the two angles and it turns out because of the random phase that term averages to zero. So those are some examples of stationary signals. We're going to conclude with a couple more terms. You will sometimes see the term wide sense stationary and that refers to a signal where only the mean and the autocorrelation or autocovariance are invariant with time. So higher order moments, like a third moment or the probability density function, could be changing with time. But if we know the first two don't change, we would say that it's wide sense stationary. And that's pretty relevant for signal processing because most of the time we're only working with the first two moments, the mean and the autocorrelation or autocovariance anyway. It's not often practical to work with higher order statistics, so this is the one that we're most interested in. There's another term that's called ergodic. We say a signal is ergodic 
if an ensemble average is equal to a time average. So for an ensemble average, we think about reaching into this bin filled with random signals and pulling different signals out multiple times. And then I'm averaging over different reaches into the bin. I would average over multiple x's that I pull out in the bin. That's what the expectation means. And I get some mean mu. And similarly, I can think about the covariance or the, what I've written here would be the autocorrelation. And I reach into the bin and reach into the bin over many different waveforms. I average that, the expectation, and I get some autocorrelation eta of k. Now, if this the signals in this bin are ergodic, then this averaging over multiple pulls out of the bin can be replaced by averaging over time for one signal. If n, the number of time samples that I average over, is large enough, then this ensemble average represented by the expectation is going to be the same as the time average. To get the mean, I'm just going to average over multiple time samples of the signal and divide by n. And similarly, the autocorrelation I can get by averaging over product of delayed values of a signal and allowing the time index to run from 1 to cap n and divide it by n. So if the signal is ergodic, I can replace this idea of the expectation with a time average. That's pretty practical for us to do in many situations. Normally, we're going to estimate our statistics of a signal when we use them in signal processing from time averages like this. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, in some experiments, you can repeat the experiment multiple times. Like if you're measuring signals from the brain, you can apply a stimulus multiple times and record what happens each time. And that's sort of like taking and grabbing different signals out of the bin. And so we do have the opportunity in some of those cases to do an ensemble average, but more often we have a single observed waveform and we want to find statistics and then we have to use these time averages. And to do that, we need to make the assumption that the signal is ergodic.